I am reminded of the story that David Roderick, the chairman of U.S. Steel in the late 80s, liked to tell. A speaker was introduced as the most gifted and brightest businessman in the country, evidenced by the fact that he, he had made a million dollars in California oil. When the businessman rose to speak, he appeared a bit embarrassed. The facts, as reported, were essentially accurate, he said, but he felt compelled to correct a few things. It wasn't oil, it was coal, and it wasn't California, it was Pennsylvania. It wasn't a million, it was a hundred thousand. And it wasn't him, it was his brother. <laughs> and he didn't make the money, he lost it. <laughs> Nonetheless, I am grateful for all those kind words and for the opportunity to serve Tidewater Community College and its constituents as the fifth president. I know that I have become part of a remarkable 45-year success story, and I am humbled by the vision and commitment to this college of its founders and of those who preceded me as president. When I began to think about what I wanted to convey to you that would characterize my presidency, I kept reflecting on what I have learned since I came here in July, starting with the extraordinary financial support from business and community leaders, as well as individuals who stepped forward to become sponsors of this inauguration after I asked that we raise money to pay for this event rather than using public dollars. They are listed in your program, and I thank you all for your support. I also thought about those who work and teach at TCC, and those in the community who give tremendously of their time, talent, and treasure in service to the college. About those in the community who donate their time to volunteer at nonprofit organizations and serve on boards, and of course, about those in the military who serve not only the community, but their country. Over and over, what came to my mind were two words, leadership and service. I've spent a good deal of time thinking about the marriage of those two qualities into what we know as servant leadership and how I view my role in the college and in the community. This idea of servant leaderships was best articulated by the late Robert Greenleaf during, early, during nearly 40 years as an AT&T executive. He brought about management innovations unheard of in the mid 20th century, such as promoting women and African Americans, exploring the broader implications of corporate decision making, and exposing young leaders to the humanities. After he retired, he wrote an essay entitled The Servant as Leader, in which he proposed, and I quote, the servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. The concept may seem unique, but it is really not. The gospel writer Luke describes a leader as one who serves. The German writer Hermann Hesse, in Journey to the East, tells the story of Leo, who appears to be a servant for a group of men on a mythical journey, but is actually the glue that holds the group together. Years later, one of the members learns that Leo is really the great and noble leader of a religious order. Leo the leader was first a servant. When we understand the concept of servant leadership, we unlock a rich secret source of energy, of legitimate power, and of the kind of toughness that is necessary to be an effective leader. The servant leader is sharply different from the person who decides to be a leader and not a servant first. The person who wants to be a leader first has a need for power, perhaps, or they want to acquire money for material possessions. The servant leader, on the other hand, pays attention to others' needs and makes sure that their highest priorities are met. It has been said that American community colleges are the Ellis Island of higher education, and thus their mission is just that, 
to serve the needs of those who come to our proverbial and also our real shores. Another way of differentiating the two is this. One says, I am the leader. Your job is to follow me. The other says, where would you like to go? I'll help you get there. I see all of our teachers, our counselors, myself in this role, helping students go anywhere. It takes strength and toughness to be a servant leader. The great Indian leader, Mahatma Gandhi, said this about the benefits of servant leadership. It's the action, not the fruit of the action, that's important. You have to do the right thing. It may not be in your power, may not be in your time, that there'll be any fruit, but that doesn't mean that you stop doing the right thing. You may never know what results come from your action, but if you do nothing, there will be no results. Gandhi epitomized the servant leadership. He said, as the ant once told the elephant, it's not always size that indicates real strength. Sometimes the greatest leaders are the most unimposing figures. What Gandhi lacked in size and family background, he more than made up for in charisma, speaking skills, and an unflagging desire to help his people and his country through a period of civil change. Dr. Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela, who also led their respective countries through similar transitions, also exemplify the qualities of servant leaders. Leadership is an art or a craft, sometimes to be learned over time, but not simply by reading books. Leadership is more tribal than scientific, more of a weaving of relationships than an acquisition of information. The best way to discuss true leadership is by describing four traits or skills that leaders exhibit. The first is vision, a compelling idea, an inspiration that people are drawn toward. It is a whole lot more than making an organization work well. It is more than just having the books balanced and all machinery working well, the floors clean and new state-of-the-art buildings. Without the sense of a direction of where the organization is heading, that organization is like a ship in tip-top shape, but without a captain. Just as important as having a vision is the second element of leadership, ability to articulate it. I don't mean talking you, to you the way I am talking with you right now, or tweeting, or making announcements on Facebook. Instead, we must be able to share our vision so that people can see it and be willing to walk with us. In other words, and this is the third critical element, a leader must demonstrate belief in herself as well as in the vision. Recently, we held college-wide strategic planning sessions. The facilitator, Dr. Cynthia Heelan, introduced a video which had been created by a National Geographic photographer, DeWitt Jones, in which he described how the beauty in nature can be seen if one believes first that it is there. Believe it and you will see it. He said, we have the power to choose how we see the world and the power to choose how we want to live in it. And so it is with leaders and their vision. They must first believe in their vision before they're able to begin the process of having others believe in it. It takes the blend of having a vision, believing in that vision, and articulating that vision to make something happen, to pull or sometimes push people toward that vision in order to yield visible and positive results. But the path is uncertain, even dangerous. A leader initiates, provides the ideas and the structure, and takes along with those who follow the risk of failure with a chance for success. The group crucial fourth element is trust. Trust that the vision is predicated on reliability and integrity. Trust in each other to know that we are pursuing a common vision. Trust that we are recognized as individuals and as members of a collective moving forward with common focus. Over the years, I have had the privilege of meeting men and women who are true leaders, and I have been humbled by being in their presence. The late Dr. Carolyn Desjardins 
founding executive director of the National Institute for Leadership Development, was one of those individuals. I owe her my gratitude for her belief in me. Carolyn, the leader of leaders, believed first and foremost that women are capable of leadership. She was able to instill in us that same belief, which in turn helped us to achieve leadership positions in community colleges. Today, more than a quarter of United States community colleges are led by women. Leaders are not leaders because of power, position, or authority, but because they want to make a difference. They want to make life better for someone else. Carolyn used to say, it's the power of love, not the love of power that is important. Let us not move forward because we like power, position, or authority, but because we are servant leaders. Max Dupre put it this way in his book, leadership is an art. The first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. The last is to say thank you. In between the two, the leader must become a servant and a debtor. I view my first 10 months at TCC as the time to define reality as it relates to TCC's future. Having been a college president for 15 years now, I find that I have been pretty well prepared for most issues. And I had really done my homework on TCC before I submitted my application. Nevertheless, it was a surprise to discover shortly after my arrival that our enrollments for the fall semester were down considerably. Wow, after 15 years of staggering enrollment increases, TCC's enrollments were down by nearly 10%. Just then I had a little talk with myself. It kind of went like this. Edna, your timing really stinks. <laughs> <laughs> this is the third presidency where you arrive and either the financial house of the college is in disarray or the enrollments are in decline or both. Next time, you really need to learn to make better time career decisions. <laughs> but then I realized how selfish that thinking was. Plus, I am not planning on a next time. So I had better learn to understand this new reality and instead ask, what are you going to do about it and what is right about this TCC reality? So one of my first orders of strategic business was to ask for an analysis of the reasons for the decline and then to commission the development of an aggressive strategic recruitment plan, one which will ultimately be embedded into the comprehensive strategic enrollment management plan. The recruitment plan is being implemented as we speak, and we're confident that we will not only turn the enrollment decline around, but we will continue our mission of making a difference in the lives of our students and the communities we serve. That effort also includes a rededication of ourselves to the common purpose of one college. Members of the Strategic Planning Committee are on a journey to choose TCC's destinies, and they're expecting to achieve it with success. This group of nearly 30 individuals comprising staff, faculty, and students has come together to form a common vision, define common purposes, and with college community input, define the common focus using the Appreciative Inquiry Planning Tool. Involving nearly 500 people, this process has begun to make everyone feel a part of this movement forward. What positive energy that has generated, and that is a reality we can be proud of. With that will come change, and I am quite cognizant of how most people feel about change. My challenge is not only leading people to embrace the vision, purpose and focus, but also to have them become comfortable with all the changes that come about with the pursuit of that vision. And now a few words about my personal realities. First among them is a wonderful and supportive family. Were it not for the love and encouragement from my children, Lisa and Nick, back in 1997, when I pursued my first college presidency, I would not have been able to do so with passion dedication and the time commitment necessary to fill the duties of college president. They were often my unofficial escorts 
to various functions and conferences. I love you for that, Nick and Lisa. And I owe you my service as mother, and I will forever be in your debt for supporting me in these opportunities. <laughs> and I have a wonderful supportive husband who often gently reminds me in the midst of work obligations and a 24-7 schedule that at the end of my life, what counts will likely be more the hours spent with loved ones than the hours I worked. Bill, I thank you for keeping me balanced. I love you. Before I close, I want to mention just a few of the major activities we are engaged in at TCC and to issue a challenge to us all. I've already mentioned the development of the next college strategic plan and the enrollment management plan and increased service to our students. There are also new academic programs being developed, such as degrees and certificates in trade and technologies, the construction and the expansion plans at the campuses, the child care centers at the new student centers, which will be integrated with our early childhood development program in support of our commitment to early childhood education with our sister community colleges of Eastern Shore and Paul de Camp. Increasing the federal and state grant initiatives, such as the National Science Foundation grant for maritime technologies and the Department of Labor grant for electronic health records, a 12 state effort in which TCC has trained over 4,000 practitioners and educators in this field. Emerging from this grant, is an innovative effort which will continue to provide high-level training for physicians and their staff on electronic health records management. Furthermore, we have strengthened the relationships with all of our school divisions for dual enrollment and curriculum alignment and possible joint faculty training. We're increasingly recognized as a quality workforce training provider and a major force in the region's economic development. The new Center for Military and Veteran Education is serving over 14,000 students annually, and over 13,000 students use our online courses to pursue their degree goals. TCC will offer the nation's first textbook-free degree program this fall, and I could go on and on. The point I am trying to make is that all of these efforts are positioning the college for a destiny of a continued success. As William Jennings Bryan, the American statesman and lawyer said, destiny is not a matter of chance. It is a matter of choice. It is not a thing to be waited for. It is a thing to be achieved. It has become quite evident how those activities are beginning to shape our college community and how the stage is being set for our destiny. I challenge us all, collectively and individually, to choose our destiny and to achieve a common vision, a common purpose, and common focus so that Tidewater Community College this next 45 years will be even more remarkable. And thank you for your attention and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you.